they never had any kind of democracy. The security legislation in Hong Kong was not adequate to deal with the situation. This was close to terrorism. I did actually pass through Hong Kong um, in, I think it was December of last year. Um, and it was very depressing because uh, the place was sort of, you know, which used to be very shiny and polished, um, uh, was looking uh, slightly, not, it would be an exaggeration to say that it was like a war zone, but it was certainly, you know, had the after effects of being a riot zone. It, it was quite depressing. But uh, I did live in Hong Kong, actually, from... Uh, from uh, 1998 to 2001. I think that uh, a lot of people who talk fondly about Hong Kong, uh, Westerners, they don't experience anything like that. In fact, they don't really get to know Hong Kong. In fact, beyond the point, they're not interested in getting to know Hong Kong in, in the round. They just, you know, there's a lot of sentiment, say amongst the British, there's this sort of sentiment, you know, well, we did Hong Kong proud, and then the Chinese are screwing it up. It's, it's, I think, quite, uh, you know, that's that's a kind of sentiment, I think, which is widespread, not just on the right, but on the left. If you take a newspaper like The Guardian, you know, really, it's full of kind of a certain nostalgia uh, for Hong Kong. Yeah, well, I don't think they really know Hong Kong, actually. They just know the part that they want to know about. And I have to say to you that, I, in my view, um, the way it was covered... Uh, was very extremely one-sided and biased uh, because uh, certainly in this country, in my own country, which is the UK, uh, everything was really blamed on on the SAR government and to some extent the Chinese government. Um, and the fact that the rioters were behaving in a way which they would never tolerate in any Western city, they were given a pass. You know, they didn't get criticised. I mean, the Guardian coverage was disgraceful because it uh, never sought to give an accurate picture of the situation, which was that uh, there was a lot of violence uh, and a lot of vigilantism on, this, on the part of those uh, who were rioting. Uh, of course, you know, the police uh, were tough as well, and I'm sure they uh, often exceeded their powers, but no more, you know, Nothing like what the American police are doing at the moment in the in the situation in regarding uh, uh, George Floyd and so on. I think there are several factors operating. I think that the first one is that there's always been in Hong Kong a underlying hostility towards mainland Chinese. Uh, when I was living there. They looked down on the mainland Chinese as poorer, as badly educated, uh, and as uh, sort of uncivilized. It was like a racial prejudice, and it was very strong. Uh, and that was the sentiment. Uh, so there's been, so it's not just a political question. It's always presented in just simple political terms. It was not like that. Uh, there's a long history to this, and I think that that the anti-mainland Chinese uh, uh, attitude uh, has a much, much longer roots. There was also the general sentiment in Hong Kong, unlike in Macau for the handover, I don't think there was popular enthusiasm for it. I'm not saying that most people were against it, uh, but there were certainly some people who were against it, but they recognised that it was historically uh, inevitable uh, and necessary. For example, at the time of the handover, I was actually uh, in Hong Kong for the handover. Uh, and it was, you know, it wasn't a celebration. Uh, it was a firework display on two nights, a British one and then an even better Chinese one the following day. Um, you contrast that with Macau, because I was in Macau uh, for um, the handover and the people on the streets and there were great celebrations. So the Macanese were very pleased about the handover. And the reasons are to do with, you know, that Hong Kong had become very prosperous, Mac uh, Macau wasn't so prosperous, the Portuguese were more integrated than the British with the Chinese and so on. There are lots of uh, reasons uh, for this. 
So I think that the first thing is to understand that uh, the handover of Hong Kong did not in the first instance have a popular base and also there was this kind of uh, uh, racism uh, 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 amongst a lot of Hong Kong Chinese people uh, towards the main mainlanders as being poorer uh, and uh, inferior. So I think that's one factor to take into account. A second factor uh, is that there was a mentality amongst the Hong Kong Chinese uh, that they that, that the prosperity of Hong Kong between about let's say nine, the late seventies and uh, and nineteen ninety seven uh, was a result of their own efforts. In fact, I think this is um, uh, uh, the British like to think it was because of them, but that's not true. Uh, the, the reason they did work, uh, Hong Kong did very well during this period, and it did do well, was because Deng Xiaoping opened up China in a sequential way. And during that period, Hong Kong served in effect as the front office uh, of China. So uh, Hong Kong greatly profited uh, from uh, that situation. Um, and uh, uh, so, it, I mean, there was a tendency amongst Hong Kongers to think, you know, oh, we did it. You know, they sort of walked on water. They had a, actually, to be honest with you, during that period, they were quite arrogant, not just towards the Chinese, but towards other parts of uh, uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia. Another issue is that basically after the handover, I think that the Hong Kong economy, well, some parts of it did fine, uh, but generally it didn't do brilliantly. I suppose its growth rate maybe was slightly less than it had been previously. It was not great. Meanwhile, over the border, especially in Shenzhen, but in Guangdong province, in Guangzhou, but especially in Shenzhen, just over the border, Shenzhen did brilliantly uh, and grew like crazy and became you know, a major tech center. There was more and more Chinese tourism. And although they looked down on the mainland Chinese, I mean, the fact of the matter was that Chinese tourists were rather more, uh, uh, were often uh, a lot more prosperous than a fair number of the Hong Kong Chinese. So they felt really as if their nose was a bit out of joint. I mean, around the time of the handover, uh, the Hong Kong economy was a fifth quarter the size of China's. Today, it's less than 3%. Now, you also got to add to this the fact that, the Ho that Hong Kong was a colony, a British colony. And after the handover, of course, it remained essentially a colonial economy. Uh, it was dominated by the tycoons. They largely control, controlled the supply of land. As a result of that, uh, uh, prices of property were kept artificially high. Typical oligopolistic colonial economy, uh, which was really non-competitive. And it was a fan extremely unequal society. So there's a lot of factors going on which made Hong Kong a troubled place, an unhappy place. And on the back, and so the dissatisfaction uh, was not just directed, well, it was directed at government, it was directed about extradition, but uh, question and so on, but it was about a deeper, uh, in my view, a deeper uh, weakness uh, in, in Hong Kong. When the British rule ended in 1997, the British had a very repressive security law. And that, as they did in all their colonies, uh, detention, very few rights and so on. They had it for 156 years and they never had any kind of democracy. In fact, Hong Kong now is more dem democratic in, their, in that sense than it was under the British. I mean, classically, uh, British colonial rule never never introduced uh, democracy into its colonies. This is the height of hypocrisy. I mean, this was absolute characteristic of British colonial rule virtually in, in, all, in, in all its major instances. And after the handover, there was, it was not replaced with anything. Uh, the intention was to replace it. And in 2003, a security law, Article 23, was drawn up. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't passed. There was a lot of opposition to it. And so, uh, the chief executive at that time uh, withdrew it. Um, and there was no security law, and there hasn't been ever since. Now, you can see 
with the situation last year, you know, every country has to have a, some kind of secure, security law. I mean, the Americans are always going on now about, you know, they need to strengthen their security. They don't want any Chinese companies. They don't want Chinese investment. Uh, they don't want Chinese experts coming over to the United States and working in certain kind of areas on security grounds. You know, secure, every country is conscious of its security. I think it was clear the legislation, security legislation in Hong Kong, was not adequate to deal with the situation. I mean, this was, you know, large scale riot, rioting. I mean, you know, this was, this was, a, this was close to terrorism. Uh, and, and so I think that there is a need for uh, some, some legislation of this kind. Of course, it depends exactly what the legislation is like and so on. The difficulty is that because the um, LegCo and the Hong Kong government had been unable uh, to introduce legislation on these lines, eventually, because of last year, the Chinese government said, well, we need it. And if you can't do it, then we'll have to do it. And I think that is a reasonable argument. Uh, they need the legislation. Uh, and they need they need laws of this kind. Uh, they need to prevent what happened last year because no uh, no civilized country would tolerate that kind of behavior. So why should the West expect Hong Kong and the Chinese to tolerate that kind of behavior? Then, of course, it depends on exactly what the legislation is like and uh, how it's applied. Uh, and it could be applied in a, a general and somewhat indiscriminate way, or it could be. Uh, it could be applied, we don't know because we haven't seen the legislation, but it could be applied in a very specific way. And I think it should be applied in a very specific way. And some of the people who were involved last year should be charged under, it seems to me, the appropriate security legislation. I think China has been basically uh, very honourable uh, in its uh, attitude towards one country, two systems. Sure, I mean, you know, there's been changes, but overall, over a period of, you know, we're halfway through the 50 year period, uh, up, up until now, up until this present situation, uh, the Chinese, I think, have been very observant of it, have been true uh, to one country, two systems. I've always thought, though, actually, the problem was not what the West accused China of, but was something different, which is that I felt that China didn't actually put enough on the need on the question of one country it's not hong kong is going to be one country two systems forever it's for 50 years so what happens after that well obviously what's going to happen is by a steady process uh, hong kong is going to be integrated into china and america has take, taken a very aggressive increasingly aggressive uh, stance towards China. I think the underlying reason for the increased hostility towards China now uh, is because the, um, the United States has moved to a situation where it thinks China is a threat to its position in the world. And that's what's changed the, the American attitudes. And so they're exploiting every weakness every uh, that they see. And Hong Kong, you know, cl clearly because Hong Kong is divided, uh, they see this as an opportunity. The, the problem is last year was really, in my view, a public relations disaster for China. To have a situation in Hong Kong where you have those kind of demonstrations uh, by young people, that kind of violence and so on, uh, I mean, it, it, there are two problems with it uh, for China. Uh, one, uh, law and order, but secondly, even more important, is that it looks as if the population, or a large section of it, don't support uh, the uh, SAR government or, or China. So. Uh, China has been in a weak position. And th this is why I don't think you should leave your questions uh, just where you are about to leave it, which is, so, okay, you introduce a security law. Is that all you're going to do? Because if that's all China does, then how are you going to win the hearts and minds of the Hong Kong population? Because the reality of the situation at the moment is that for a variety of reasons, which I tried to explain at the beginning, there's a lot of uh, unease uh, and dis dissatisfaction in the Hong Kong population. So a security law, well, you might be able, if you, if, you act, if you act in a crude way, you might be able to repress it, but you don't solve the problem. We have in English the expression, you know, the carrot and the stick. Well, I think actually there is a need for a stick, but I think there's a need for a bigger carrot. <laughs>
And my view is that uh, the difficulty is that basically there's been not enough reforms in Hong Kong. That, uh, that broadly speaking, it's still in out, broad outline, rather similar to what, to what it was under the British. So therefore, you still have a colonial economy dominated by the same tycoons with the same levels of inequality uh, of income. And you've got a political system which is a, colo a British colonial political system. So the great question here for China, I think, is sure, let's have the national security law, but equally, even more important in my view, is a reform program to transform Hong Kong and give a real sense of hope and enthusiasm to the Hong Kong population, especially the young people. And uh, so, I mean, look how China has done that in China. I mean, you know, the great reform program from 1978 led to the most dramatic transformation we've ever seen in human history in terms of economics, in terms of living standards, in terms of the reduction of poverty. Now, Hong Kong's not in the same position today as China was in 1978. So we're not talking about exactly the same thing. But what is needed is a vision uh, like this, which can politically win over those sections of the Hong Kong population who are uh, uh, oppositional or disillusioned or uncertain and so on. And that I think is critical.